Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, regards from uh, Milan. I am uh, Marco Buoni, and I pass to my colleague Silvia for the introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are right now. Uh, we are now live with our webinar. So first of all, welcome. My name is Silvia. As my director said before, it is my pleasure now to give a short introduction while we wait for more people to connect. I see that we have already a great number of people connected. This makes me very happy. So um, what we are going to talk about today is monitoring and managing HVAC in our systems. That's the title of our webinar. Let me give you an introduction on the instructions of our webinar, how it's going to work. We'll have two speeches. Uh, each speech will last about 20 minutes. At the end of each speech, there's going to be a short Q&A session. And so for this reason, you'll find on the right part of the platform, the section dedicated to the questions. So please ask your questions anytime. We will read them to the speakers at the end of their speech. And this is very, very important for you. It will be also be uh, the, um, the basis for the final debate. So at the end of the two presentations, this is going to, be, to happen. You will receive the material of the presentations afterwards. And also you can get in touch with the speakers because they are going to leave their uh, contact details. So if we may pass to the next slide, we also, we also have a very important message to convey. As you can see, uh, yesterday was the World Ozone awesome Day. So this is one more important reason why we're here today, because yesterday we uh, were busy in these celebrations. As you well all know, uh, it was proclaimed, this day was proclaimed back in 1994 by a UN General Assembly as the international day to protect and preserve the ozone layer. The ozone layer protects us and it is our duty to protect it. So our sector has a lot to do with this, a lot of our efforts go into this direction. And so this is also one reason why we are here to share knowledge on this important topic. But now I don't want to steal your time. So uh, this you can see um, on the screen, the names of our speakers, which is my big pleasure to introduce. You can see uh, Dr. Heinz Jürgensen, Director Application Engineering and Product Performance from Vita who is going to talk to us about handling H12 refrigerants in maintenance, repair, and retrofit. After his presentation, uh, Kyle Masden, technical sales engineer from Freepiece Instruments, will present us the importance of vacuum. So now it is my big pleasure to hand the word to Marco Buoni, who is the president of the European Association of Refrigeration and Air Conditioning, but furthermore is the technical director of Centro Studi Galileo. So thank you all for your attention and please enjoy the webinar. We have also Alberto, who is our technical department uh, always in the background so thank you Heinz nice to see you Heinz uh, hello good afternoon good afternoon hello Kyle and uh, yeah. so Green. good afternoon so I will uh, give a small introduction about the topics we are going to say today I will put your camera off so I will have five minutes of presentation while everybody is going to join our webinar so Give me these five minutes uh, for a small presentation. So, thank you again for being here. Uh, I'm the president of ARIA, Secretary General of ATF, and um, uh, as said, the Director of Centro Studi Galia. ARIA, which is the most uh, uh, you know, the important role that I have, uh, is a European Association of Refrigeration and Conditioning uh, Association. I thank uh, some of our members that are hearing us, uh, for example, from Spain, I can see, hello. So uh, ARIA is 26 association, 22 countries. Uh, and we uh, work at the European level because we have a lot to do at the European level for the gas review, for energy efficiency, for many other aspects. And I want to tell you today some new aspects that are going to, you know, are going to be very important in the next uh, two years. We are going to see the FGAS review. What means? It means that uh, um, the European Commission give a consortium, nominated a consortium to evaluate the FGAS, review, the FGAS uh, uh, regulation. Uh, Ricardo of the Research of the Institute and small independent contractor started an evaluation, and we, as ARIA and other 75, uh, other 74 uh, uh, stakeholders, gave their consideration so they gave a consideration input about the evaluation 
and we said that the FGAS uh, review can be improved. We want to have the FGAS uh, regulation improved. We want to include uh, some aspects that I'm going to say to you now. But now we are in a moment very crucial. We are finished the uh, first roadmap, the feedback period, and we are going to start the public consultation. Up to the end of this year, will be a public consultation between the European Commission to ch check what we want from a new FGAS regulation. We want, of course, alignment with the Montreal Protocol, with legal amendments. We want some reduction in sectors non covered. We want implementation and enforcement issues like illegal trade to be fight, training with alternatives. But the area, we did uh, a survey among our 22 members, uh, sorry, 26 members from 22 countries, and uh, we want some precise uh, uh, changes. We want training, we want certification and competence on alternative refrigerants, A2L, flammables, uh, CO2, ammonia, to avoid the risk uh, that can be using flammable refrigerants, for example. Uh, we want mandatory training, uh, sorry, mandatory certification, Training as it is now for FGAS to leave uh, to leave it uh, uh, as um, books uh, experience, uh, but of course uh, training in classroom, which is the most important part. Because we are going to talk about uh, practical training. We want practical training because the issue is practical safety, practical service, using the right tools, using the right recovery machine, uh, vacuum charge, uh, leak detector, etc. We have issues for the Brexit, mutual recognition of certificates. We want harmonization among our member states. The duration of a certification will be similar in all member states. For example, in France, and I think also in Germany, is for the life your certification. Maybe we think we should have maybe a certain amount of duration, maybe 10 years. And after that, we have so many technological, technological uh, changes maybe we need to be updated. We need to update on new refrigerants, new CO2, uh, compressors, uh, or whatever. Okay, implementation, illegal trade, fight illegal trade. We think now it's 25% of the refrigerants coming from illegal sources, from uh, Russia, Turkey, from uh, China, uh, in containers, so we should fight illegal refrigerants and uh, we should include alternative refrigerants we said already and we should, should uh, enlarge the scope to include that the phase down also is important we think the phase down can be even improved uh, we should look to the lifetime of the systems we should look to the energy efficiency of the system not just the gwp but also the tiwi we should think we think that also the uh, the sea sector should be the ship sector should be included because there, there is a lot of emission uh, from the sea uh, not only from the stationary system but also from the sea we have already uh, automotive why don't include also ship where they have we have so many uh, r22 systems still uh, in ships i know it's not easy but uh, we want to do it um, we talked about this in our european com conference last uh, year uh, in uh, june and we are going to talk again in June 2021, the 10th or 11th, with the European Commission, with the companies that we have now, Bitzer and Field Peace. And uh, we are going to talk with 300 experts from all the major associations, United Nations, uh, European Commission, uh, uh, IIR, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll be there. Also, we do training. Tetos Vigileo do training everywhere in the world, over 140 countries covered. And of course, Italy, where I, where I call you from, I will speak to you from. Um, we are training in Argentina, Armenia, et cetera. But also I suggest you Real Alternatives. Real Alternatives is a project which is very interesting, very interesting about alternative refrigerant training free of charge. You can download the material and learn. And also we uh, provide certification. At the end of the training for from the region, we will have a certificate valid in 19 countries worldwide. And we are growing more and more. Uh, we have Mauritius interested in it. We have um, Maldives. We have um, 
Canada interest to it, US interest to join. Uh, already are joining New Zealand, uh, Turkey, and all Europe. All European countries are joining the alternative refrigerant training and certification. Also, we did a, um, a publication which was presented at the last Montreal Water Conference where we talk about alternative refrigerant and new technology. This was my brief presentation, introduction, to give you an idea of what we do and what is the machinery. We need more competence. And today we are going to do, give you some uh, knowledge about best practices with alternative refrigerant, with classic refrigerant, about doing the right vacuum, around doing the right uh, procedures for you to do the best work you can. Of course, I thank my partners that every, in every webinar helps us to achieve these uh, objectives, these aims. In a technical point of view, they always give the best knowledge possible, the best competence. They are experts from all the sectors, the RAC sector. So please get the most of it. So I now pass my word to uh, Heinz. So I ask uh, Heinz to turn on. Uh, so I should see Heinz in a second. Yes, I can see you, Heinz. Hello, Heinz. And I will share the screen uh, with you. So you will see in a second, share your screen mode i think you can yes we can see you perfectly in your presentation handling a two refrigerant in maintenance repair retrofit thank you Heinz, and we also see your um, your laser <laughs> okay very good and i hope you hear me also yes i hear you very well thank you Heinz. <laughs> very good yes today i have brought with me a condensed um, presentation on handling HOL refrigerants and maintenance, repair, and retrofit. We have in our application engineering where we support customers uh, and also discuss about a lot of different refrigerants, very often been uh, asked for support for the practical handling. And we have tried to put this together here. So background is these new refrigerants and safety class A2L. They are called mildly flammable, but they can ignite, they can burn, it can be dangerous, but they are fortunately not so easy to ignite. So uh, what we have found is a very good report from HRI where they have done a source evaluation, ignition source evaluation. And they have run a lot of tests with different refrigerants, different air refrigerant mixtures, and different possible ignition sources. Because the most important thing when you make a evaluation of the risk uh, is you have to find out what can be considered ignition source that can give a flame or it cannot. And fortunately, this report helps us a lot here because it has shown that many things cannot ignite the A2L refrigerants. All those we know today cannot be ignited by mechanical sparks, like when you drop your tool to a stone floor with propane, it would ignite immediately, but with A2L refrigerants, no chance. So you could leave your standard tools. The same even when you have power tools, you drill your grinders, they make sparks in the motors. And they can surely not ignite that they uh, these sparks are not strong enough and even when you take a grinder and grind on the stone which gives very hot and very strong sparks cannot ignite and most glowing surfaces and wires glowing surfaces in total we have not found any that can ignite these refrigerants if you have a wire which is very freestanding let's say more than five millimeters from any other areas maybe so the test equipment which is used to find the flammability is designed with a freestanding wire and this can ignite or with a very strong spark but the wires you for example have in a toaster which are close to a wall or things like that they cannot 
We have found that in a report which is freely available. And we have seen, uh, we have, you have to take care of about the flammability, but you have to know what is needed to ignite. And then we have taken our experts from application engineering who have field experience with many refrigerants and many systems, put them together and make a workshop on what are the handling steps in real practice which you have to think about what could be special with a flammable refrigerant apart from what you know as a skilled worker that is used to make repair and maintenance where do you have to have extra caution and where do you need to have special tools and we have put that together with some examples we selected so and then one of the first questions always is what special tools do you need do you need them always and so on and we have copied a list here from a refrigerant manufacturer checked that and condensed that to the comparison for example a non-flammable refrigerant 404a and an a2l refrigerant you can use your mani manometer manifold uh, the routine one you have you also the charging hoses as I said, the standard tools like the torque wrench, even if you drop it, is no risk, cannot ignite. You should also be able to use the brazing torch, but you have to know that the brazing torch will always be able to ignite the refrigerant, so you can only use it when there's no refrigerant in the air. So you have to be extra careful. Do never open the tube with the brazing torch. Always cut it with the tube cutter. Even if there's some oil inside which might have some refrigerant, don't open it with a brazing torch. Uh, the tube bending tools and so are all standard, but there was a small hint. Take with you a small extra fan, a very small thing with a cable on. Uh, you place that in the entrance door to the room where you are working on the refrigerant and it will blow in some fresh air. So if there is a small leak somewhere, it cannot collect on the floor. It is distributed and blown out. You can use your standard scales for putting in the refrigerant. You can use the standard vacuum pump, but we recommend that you have a long cable with the switch outside the room. So if you have to go out because of the higher concentration of flammable refrigerant, you can switch it out from the outside. You need to have with you a power or powder or CO2 extinguisher, which can extinguish flames if there are some. Uh, they, this is not always necessary with the non-flammable refrigerant if you're not doing work with an open flame, like soldering. But with the H2L refrigerant, you always have to have it with you. So it's the same extinguisher, but you always have to have it with you. We recommend that you take a mobile gas detector with you, which is certified, means which is qualified by the manufacturer for this gas you're working with for A to L refrigerants. So it can detect them and can warn you. So if there's no gas, gas warning system in the room, you can have this one on you and it alarms you so you can leave the room. You need to have an electronic leak detector, which is qualified, certified by the manufacturer for the refrigerant you're looking for. That's clear, it has to detect the leak. And then there's a small thing, if you're handling a flammable refrigerant, also HOL, your bottle will have to have a left-hand thread where you place the connector on. That's a standard saying that, so you can't come around that. You should not charge the HOL refrigerant in your standard cylinders with the right hand thread. And you need to have a refrigerant recovery machine which is qualified for the HOL refrigerant. The recommended mobile gas detector, this one is like the sample of what we have in our lab, which usually is used for methane or propane, things like that. The sensor can detect everything that's flammable has to be adjusted and calibrated to the refrigerant you're using or 
components of the refrigerant you're using. So there are examples of tools. Uh, a small fan can be anyone. There are different manufacturers of mobile gas detectors, gas warning systems, uh, of different uh, manufacturers of leak detectors. Tube cutters are the standard ones, you know, or tube piercing uh, tools so you don't open with a flame. A standard powder or CO2 extinguisher a special bottle with the left hand thread. You could also take stickers with warning signs with you for some cases if it's not already on the system or if you take a compressor out and put that on for returning it to the remanufacturing. And we recommend you take some warning signs with you, uh, which you which I will come back to what they will be used for. Uh, so what we have done with the workshop results is we have developed a technical information, we call it an online document, which is accessible to everybody, called Refrigerants of Safety Class A to L, Guidelines and Practical Handling for Maintenance, Repair and Retrofit. We target skilled refrigeration personnel, so we don't write every single word step, only that extra for A to L. You give a short intro to flammability and to on-site risk assessment for the work you're doing. And then we go through four examples of handling and what to do on-site when you open the system. Because when you open, there might be a risk for flammable refrigerant coming out, so you have to take extra care about that. And uh, I will go through some of the steps of one of the examples here. And that is the, one of the more complex one, assuming you have to exchange a compressor in a zone where you might have explosive atmosphere and there might be a leak on the compressor. So I talk about semi-hermetic compressor here, operated with A2L refrigerant, so there is refrigerant in the compressor and in the oil of the compressor. For example, R454C, that's a candidate for replacing 404A. The compressor is located in a machine room. The room has some ventilation, but there is a leakage, so possibly on the compressor. So there is flammable refrigerant in the room air. That's a description I've made to show you when you want to make a risk assessment you have to look at what are you doing, what is the surrounding, what's the working steps, so that you can make an estimation, can I work safely or can I not? And what do I have to do to work safely? We have selected some tools or let's say maybe preconditions you take with you. We recommend the mobile A2L gas detector. You have to have a leak detector that can find a leak of the A2L refrigerant. You need to have the fire extinguisher because you're going to a plant where there is flammable refrigerant coming out. You need to have a compatible recovery equipment. And then we recommend that you have the pump supplied from outside the room with an external switch and an extra fan for distributing leakage. So, but you don't need to have any anti-sparking tool. If somebody wants to sell that to you for A to L, I think you should uh, tell him that he should try to show that a spark from a tool can ignite A to L. But the first thing is what we have to target for. Now we have a room, we might have to enter it and there is flammable refrigerant in the air because of a leakage. So the first goal is to get off, get rid of this explosive atmosphere or the zone where it could uh, appear. And if you have got that, then you can work as if there would not be flammable refrigerant in the air because there is no longer. And uh, when you go starting the work, there are some preconditions which are necessary. So the first thing you need is you need an educated worker. He has to know what he's doing. Whatever you're doing, 
in craftsmanship work, uh, if you're doing that with a non-educated worker, there is a risk. And in this case, we have an extra risk from flammability, so we can't have that. You have to look up the risk assessment. Let's say, according to the law, there should be a risk assessment for the operation and maintenance of systems. And at least there should be some information from the operator of the system to where and how much refrigerant, which refrigerant, and so on there is in the system. So you can prepare and make your evaluation of the safety of the work. You have your extinguisher and you're putting warning signs up, these orange ones, where you are releasing the refrigerant. Whatever you pump out of the room with the ventilation or the vacuum pump, it ends out somewhere in the atmosphere outside. And it's a good idea. No, it's a must to put up warning signs for those people who might pass there so they don't have an open fire or smoking there. So don't, don't blow it out to the smoker's corner. Then you are powering off the compressor or the system, more or less all systems in the machinery room that draw higher power because high power switching parts might be able to uh, ignite atrial refrigerant. If there's a gas warning system installed, you leave that on. And also the light is on a power level that cannot ignite, so you leave that on. You put your extra fan, you check that the outlet of the ventilation is safe also. If not, you have to put warning signs up there also. Then you go into the room with your gas detector and you check that regularly with this one uh, to see whether it's flammable or not. If there's a machinery room detector system, you can also use that. First thing you do, you stop the leak. If the leak is on the compressor, you close the valves, the shutoff valves of the compressor. If the leak is another place, you shut off with the valves of this system part. And then the best you can do is you go out again and you wait until there is no explosive atmosphere left because the ventilation has taken that out. And then you can work with no explosive zone there. If the leak was another place, you charge this part with nitrogen, then you do the work to close the leak, that can be soldering or some other things. You evacuate that part of the system, so there's no air left in that part, and then you can open the valves and the refrigerant can flow in, it will not mix with air because you have evacuated that air out. And there's more steps there. And especially those steps where a risk could appear, we have put some small description. There are checklists for the four examples we have described. If you have a slightly different case, you can use these as guide and make your own checklist what you have to do. And you will find a way how you can work safely with this. I think it is possible to work safely even in maintenance cases, which usually are considered the most risky part of the life of the uh, system, where you have to handle on open systems the refrigerant, which is flammable. We have published that in a guideline, which is freely available. Uh, and we have taken a look on what are the most important tools and preconditions you need for that. And the most important are really the skilled and ed educated worker, the good engineering practice working, and a proper information about what are the real risks, not only those you think or feel, but those knowing what are the real risks. So you can evaluate the risk of your working tasks. And then for sure, there are local regulations and standards about handling flammable stuff might be or maybe for this uh, situation where you are in there might be some restrictions and you should know those uh, and then there are very few tools you need to have special for a2l refrigerant only so and i would very much like to get feedback on your work with a2l refrigerant and especially on working with our guideline on that and with that, I thank you very much for your attention and for your patience for listening to me 
on this topic. And here is my email address also you can use to send some questions to me. Thank you, Heinz. I think it was perfect. You gave a very good um, overview of A to L, which are mildly flammable refrigerants, but they are still flammable. So it's very important what you said and the procedure that you're suggesting. Uh, we have 70 persons uh, uh, connected, so welcome everybody. Thank you, Silvia, for uh, reading the questions, please. Uh, sure. So let me start with this one because uh, it is very comprehensive and I think it's going to be useful for a lot of our um, users. So it, it has two multiple questions inside. Firstly, oh. it asks what distance should we plug a vacuum pump when using A2Ls? And then it asks how long should be the cable supply? My recommendation was just to have it outside the room uh, so that from outside where you blow in fresh air with your extra fan, there should be no explosive atmosphere. If you're opening up the system, uh, then it's typically a few meters to outside the room. That should be enough. Basically, that is also an extra caution because the plug should normally not be able to ignite that up to a kilowatt or something of power there will be a new standard and there will be new parts in the EN378 describing from what power is on it can ignite but I didn't go into the details here uh, I would say if it's just outside the room if you have a normal five meters cable or something like that that should be very well fitting hmm. okay and Second about the bathroom pump uh, the vacuum pump, I'm not so skilled in that. If the producer says um, that it can be done uh, with HOL refrigerant, usually the pump itself cannot ignite it. But uh, normally when you have an alarm, you leave the room and then it's nice to have the switch outside so you can switch it off from there. Uh, even if the pump itself should not be the risk, but if you have it running, uh, it's nicer to have the outside switch, but it's more a recommendation. It's not an absolute must. Okay, so may I go with the second question? It is from Peter or Peter, depends. It, it is about uh, the fan. So he asks, uh, normally manufacturer do not suggest an extra fan for A2Ls. They suggest it only for hydrocarbons. Is it correct? And would it be costly? Um, so that is this extra fan I recommend here is just something you have in your van when you're going to the site to repair. It's just a standard simple fan which blows some fresh air in. There is no extra specification. When okay. you are talking about the room ventilation where you have machinery which has flammable refrigerant, in that case there is special uh, demands on the fan because it, I think this one has to be X proof in that case. But the fan you're having with you to blow in a little fresh air is just a small standard uh, one which has no extra specification. Okay. Um, I think we are perfectly on time. So uh, wait, wait a second. I guess there is. There is another question. Sir? Yeah, there is one more question which seems very interesting because the others we would like to keep for the debate since they are okay. more broad. But let me read this last one from Max, and then since we're perfectly on time, I would give the word maybe to the second speaker, if uh, everybody agrees. Uh, the question reads, are A2L recovery compressors and vacuum pumps also suitable for use with A3 refrigerants like butane or propane? Yeah, I would differ that. You, it's much easier to make one suitable for A2L than for A3. Uh, so an A3 pump, a pump that is suitable for propane will for sure also work with the other ones. But a vacuum pump that is, let's say, released for A1 and A2L, I would not say that it's automatically for A3. I think there might be a difference. So that is a matter of the manufacturer of the pump to tell you. Yes. Thank you for your clarification. Thank you for listening. and. The questions. Okay, there is just a comment from Alessandra. Um, for A2L, you could use uh, uh, also mechanical connection without using brazing or flame, also mechanical connection. Thank you, yes. Alessandra. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so let's go to Kyle. I ask Kyle to come. Let's see if we see Kyle. So Kyle, I think your webcam is going to be on. Try one more time. Yes, you're coming. There you go. Hello, Kyle. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very good. How are you? Very good. So, Heinz, if you are so kind to wait for um, the debate, okay, Heinz? Okay, so I pass to Kyle. You should see a share screen. So, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Phil Peace, for being with us, for helping us for the practical training, because we're using a lot of tools uh, from Phil Peace in our practical training. And I know that many partners of Real Alternatives use. Uh, in Spain, for example, use uh, Philpis um, uh, vacuum pump uh, uh, ring detectors uh, for uh, doing training. So, Kyle is going to speak about the importance of vacuum, how to do training. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much. So, today I would like to discuss why pulling a vacuum or system evacuation is so important, and also why it is so important that it is carried out correctly, properly, and effectively as well. Now that can either be on a new install or on an existing system uh, where perhaps the integrity of the pipe work has been broken during a service visit or, or something similar. So as you can see here, the main problems that arise from an evacuation not being done correctly or, effect or effectively or efficiently is always going to lead to premature equipment failure. So some of these failures I'm going to outline now uh, we have the refrigeration diagram over on the right hand side of the screen which i'm sure a lot of you today will already be familiar with um, we'll talk about how refrigerants transfer their heat when they change phases predominantly how they absorb heat in the evaporator and release that heat within the condenser now non-condensable gases are going to be the first thing we're going to speak about so when you have non-condensable gases in a system what happens is that they simply take up space this then limits the refrigerant's ability to condense within the condenser. And this reduces the efficiency of the system uh, and forces the HVAC or refrigeration compressor to work harder. This then results in premature equipment failure, which we just spoke about. Um, and, and often a big sign of having these non-condensable uh, non gases in a system is an abnormally high pressure on the high side of the system uh, or a high head pressure as it is also sometimes referred to. So the next thing I would like to discuss uh, is moisture in a system. Any moisture or water in a refrigeration or air conditioning sim system is just simply bad news, something we really do not want in the industry. Uh, the water, uh, once it's inside the system, it can then mix with the lubricating oil uh, within the compressor, which in turn forms an acid sludge-like substance. Um, this then corrodes components and the acid can also dissolve the insulation surrounding any motor windings um, and that can also cause the com compressor to fail. Uh, since the compressor is one of the most expensive parts in a uh, air conditioning or refrigeration system, we really want to avoid changing this component and prolonging its lifespan as best as we possibly can. It's very important to not get that moisture. Uh, not only does moisture in the system cause all, all of that, all of those issues, uh, but it can also lead to other issues as well, uh, such as freezing at control components, such as an expansion device or capillary tubing. Um, and, and in turn, this can then lead to a blockage that must be then cleared before the system can run properly and efficiently. And I'm sure a number of people listening today will have probably had to have dealt with this issue on more than one occasion. So how do we avoid everything that we've just spoken about? How do we ensure that these non-condensable gases and the moisture are out of the system? The simple answer is to use good competent practices and effective evacuation methods, which we'll just go through now. So in regards to competent practices, um, here's some advice when assembling any field connections and making repairs that involve the pipe work on the system. So firstly, to make sure that the, that the fittings and refrigeration circuit components are clean and free of debris, to clean the tubing before cutting or brazing any of the pipe work, 
to also ensure that you keep any open pipe work covered. Uh, this just helps prevent any rainwater or condensation from entering the system and causing further issues down the line. Uh, to replace any filters and dryers as needed on the system, a good practice here is to replace the filter dryer anytime the system has been broken into to carry out any repairs. And then finally, it's to purge with nitrogen before and after assembling any tubing. Uh, and the ultimate goal of following these procedures and practices is just to keep the system as clean, sealed and as dry as possible prior to us using any tooling to help us achieve this. So talking of tooling, the most practical method of removing air and any other non-condensable gas from a system, um, from a refrigeration system or air conditioning system is by using a vacuum pump. Uh, now, additionally, when used, a uh, when used correctly, a vacuum pump can also remove any moisture that may be present in the system too. So when using a vacuum pump, there are some general guidelines to note alongside the competent practices that we mentioned a moment ago. And, and these are, I, I've, I've mentioned them here, and they are, we need to make sure that we choose short, dedicated, large diameter vacuum hoses where possible. We need to use a suitable manifold and vacuum measuring device and we'll get more onto measuring devices in a moment. Uh, we need to use clean oil um, for our pumps and we need to test it routinely. We need to achieve a vacuum target level or a target vacuum level to, uh, and we also need to isolate and test after this to make sure that there are no leaks or moisture still in the system. And then lastly, uh, we just need to not take shortcuts in this procedure. Taking shortcuts here can, could leave us with an inefficient unit or premature system failure. So I said we'd touch on some measuring devices for measuring vacuum. Uh, but before we get more into the tooling used for measuring, I just want to explain what vacuum measurements we are looking for in relation to the air conditioning and refrigeration industry. So when referring to vacuum, um, we are dealing with a very low pressure and very small changes in this pressure. So therefore, we need to use a very small unit of measurement to be as accurate as possible. Now, on a traditional analog manifold gauge, uh, these are often calibrated in three units of measurement, PSI, bar, and inches of mercury. However, all three of these measurements are deemed as a very coarse scale of measuring, and so as such is not generally used to measure vacuum. A more effective range for the measurement of vacuums is millimetres of mercury absolute. Now this range covers the same range as the previous three units of measurement. However, it is a much finer scale. And so the 29.9 inches of mercury, which are commonly seen on those traditional analog manifold gauges, all of a sudden becomes 760 millimeters of mercury absolute. That's 760 millimeters of mercury absolute. This range is more commonly referred to as the Tor scale and gauges are available here to measure pressures close to absolute which is typically 0 to 20 and 0 to 40 torr. Uh, microns uh, is also typically used and this allows us to have an even finer scale uh, with one torr equating to 1000 microns. This then allows us to have a clearer view of these very low pressures as you can see here on the diagram on the right with 856 microns being displayed. So we've already touched on some of these, um, but I'd just like to mention the equipment that was commonly used to measure vacuum. Uh, first, and perhaps the most common of all, is the analog manifold gauge. However, uh, that these, these, these devices just are simply not suitable um, due to the accuracy that they provide in vacuum. Uh, and whilst a lot of the industry has invested in better measuring solutions uh, that we'll come on to in a moment, it's definitely a slow transition and one that hopefully educational videos, uh, flyers uh, and webinars such as today uh, can assist in facilitating that change over to these you know, better suited equivalents. Uh, next up, um, we have the standalone tour gauge or micron gauge. Um, this type of gauge is generally acceptable for ensuring a sufficient vacuum has been achieved and is also widely available too. Now, uh, these are, are typically available in either analog or digital. Uh, and whilst digital does have the advantage of being able to show a much more accurate value, uh, it's down to personal preference as to which the engineer is to choose um, 
either analog or digital. And then lastly, we have the digital manifold gauge. Um, now the introduction of digital manifold gauges, specifically those with a dedicated vacuum sensor, has allowed the engineer to have an all-in-one device that can read both positive and negative pressure in high accuracy. Uh, so it's these last two devices, the standalone tour gauge and the digital manifold with the built-in vacuum gauge that should be being used to obtain these measurements on a system. So we've spoken about why and when it is important to achieve a good vacuum. We've spoken about good competent practices as well as the measurements of vacuum and the equipment we should be using to measure it. Uh, now I'd just like to touch on a couple of the common evacuation methods that we should be using out in the field. And that firstly is the deep vacuum method. Um, and then secondly, we have the triple evacuation method. Now I'm sure a lot of, uh, a lot of you out there listening today will be familiar with both of these methods or hopefully at least one of them, uh, but we'll go over them brief, uh, very briefly regardless. So firstly, the deep vacuum method is ultimately the best method uh, we can use, um, but it can be very time consuming, uh, typically 24 hours. Um, the degree of vacuum here, however, on this method is usually specified by the system manufacturer. So in this instance, it's very simple to know when the degree of vacuum uh, has been achieved and which degree of vacuum you're looking to achieve. Um, the, secondly, the triple evacuation method, uh, this, this method can be achieved much, much quicker, uh, typically two to three hours on a small to medium sized system, uh, but it's much more complex and it's not quite as effective um, and efficient as the deep vacuum method. So here I've outlined a step-by-step -step guide on how to achieve the triple evacuation method. And you'll also notice I've included a chart on the right, um, which outlines the target vacuum for each stage of the triple evacuation. Now, you'll also notice on that, on that, on that chart that the left-hand column has temperatures uh, in Celsius. And the reason for that is that temperatures are very important to achieving a good vacuum. And the reason for that is moisture. So water in its liquid state is the most difficult to remove from a system. And as we touched on earlier, it can also cause the most issues as well. So it's very important to ensure that we try and get all of this moisture out of the system as best as we can. Now, in order to do so with a vacuum pump, we must pull a vacuum to such a pressure that the ambient temperature around the refrigeration system will cause any of that water within the refrigeration or air conditioning system to boil. The water vapor that is then produced within the system can then easily be drawn out by the vacuum pump where it will be captured by the oil or dispersed into the atmosphere. So you can see there that on that chart, the colder the mean plant temperature is, the lower we have to get those pressures to ensure that any moisture in the system is boiling off into a vapor uh, so that the vacuum can draw that out and efficiently remove them. So taking all of what we've just spoken about, I'd just like to speak about some practical considerations that are just good general guidelines when evacuating, uh, evacuating and dehydrating uh, any refrigeration or air conditioning system. And that firstly is to use a good quality two-stage gas ballast vacuum pump. Now, for those unaware what any of that means um, or, or alludes to, uh, please allow me to explain. So in regards to the two-stage explanation, uh, to put it simply, uh, this two-stage uh, vacuum pump, having a two-stage motor, allows the vacuum pump to pull down into a deeper vacuum. It uses the first stage to pull the vacuum and then the second stage to clean the system. This then results in a higher performance uh, in getting down to those very, very low pressures. Um, and then the inclusion of a gas ballast uh, is also important. Um, the inclusion of this uh, helps us prolong the lifespan of our oil within the vacuum pump. And how it does this is by when you engage the gas ballast valve, when you initially turn on the machine, this will allow any of the harsher atmospheric non-condensable gases or any moisture that may be within the system to be vented out with, without being absorbed into the oil. So ultimately using this uh, gas, ballast, gas ballast valve, you won't be able to perform a deep vacuum. Um, however, you, it, it's very it's very worth using at the very beginning of the of the system evacuation and then should be shut off after a few minutes at the most on a medium sized system. Um, and essentially this valve is perfect for when an engineer has had uh, has been working on a system and at some point has had 
and at some point has had the system open to any atmospheric conditions such as changing a compressor or uh, or other or other other part on the system next up is to ensure that we are using equipment that is suitable for the refrigerant type being used within the system uh, and this has become increasingly more important with the inclusion of a2o refrigerants uh, such as r32 which is being used more and more in modern air, uh, modern day air conditioning systems uh, as Heinz has just alluded to uh, before me um, so while it's, whilst it's been stated multiple times before, I'm sure, uh, the introduction of A2L refrigerants has actually caused some controversy over tooling um, and, and what can and can't be used. Um, for instance, on a vacuum pump, it has been argued that in theory, the system should be free of any refrigerant and therefore any vacuum pump, whether it's rated for A2L or not, should be suitable. However, the argument against this is that some situations can happen. And we have to be prepared for an eventuality where refrigerant has become trapped in a system, be it by a closed valve or a blockage in the system. And this then can be suddenly freed, um, or suddenly become freed with the introduction of negative pressure. Uh, so this is why it's very important that we use the correct tooling rated for the refrigerant type that is being used. As you can see here at Fieldpiece, uh, we have some of our tooling uh, that is all A2L approved. Um, and for those that are not aware, even after Heinz's, uh, Heinz's speech a moment ago, A2L refrigerants are mildly flammable. And so that is what we're talking about when we are talking and discussing about these, these ratings to ensure that there are no obvious ignition points within the equipment. So next on the list is to ensure that we use a suitable vacuum pump uh, uh, chosen uh, and rated in relation to the system size. So with this in mind, it's worth noting that whilst there are hundreds of different vacuum pumps out there, it'll be down to the engineer themselves to ensure that the pump that they're using matches the system capacity. And as a rough guide here, to estimate the CFM value, uh, which stands for cubic feet per minute, um, we need to take the tonnage of the system that we're going to work on and take the square root of that number. This will then give us an approximate value of the CFM you, you, you will require for the vacuum pump. Typically, this value is around four to five CFM for domestic and light commercial systems and about six to eight CFM for larger commercial or industrial installations. As you can see here at Fieldpiece, we offer both the eight and the five CFM vacuum pump with the five CFM model being dual voltage, both 110 volts and 230 volts, which allows the end user, the engineer, to have the flexibility to work on sites where it is prohibited to use 230 volts such as building sites or the marine slash sea industry. Now, next up is arguably one of the most important factors to achieving a good vacuum, and that is to ensure that the oil within the pump is changed regularly. Now, the task of changing oil within a vacuum pump is often a convoluted and tricky one, which is why the majority of people I've spoken to within the industry, um, they often own up and admit to either not changing the vacuum pump oil frequently enough, or in some cases, uh, even admitting to never changing their vacuum pump oil at all in the whole lifespan of them, them owning that pump. Now, why it's so important to frequently change the oil is because of the functions that the oil serves within the vacuum pump. Not only does it help lubricate the internals of the machine, ensuring that the motor doesn't burn out or cease prematurely, it actually assists in cleaning out any of the contaminants from the system that you're pulling a vacuum on. And it does this by trapping them inside the oil. So once that oil has become saturated with too much of these contaminants, which is mainly moisture, uh, then the vacuum pump will struggle to reach the performance levels it's stated to. And that's simply because it just cannot absorb any more of those contaminants. A way we at Fieldpiece have tackled this issue is to in invent the run quick oil change system. Now, some of you may be familiar with this system already, but for those who aren't, I'll outline some, outline some of the benefits here. So you've got the large oil reservoir that acts as your sight glass, and that is even visible in the dark conditions, uh, thanks to the ultra bright blue LED that sits behind the reservoir. Then you've got the ball valve and bottle storage that allows for easy draining of the old oil, and then a large wide mouth fill port for easy refilling. An oil change on the fill piece vacuum pump takes around 20 to 30 seconds, 
and can also even be done with the machine running and pulling a vacuum with no vacuum loss. All of those features there um, combined make it the easiest vacuum pump oil change on the market to make the job for the engineer quicker, faster and better. So the next couple of uh, practical considerations we'll speak about in tandem as they go together quite nicely. Uh, and those are to ensure that you use a large diameter short connecting line and to ensure that you're pulling a vacuum from both the high side and the low side of the system. So another very important stage of achieving a good vacuum level is to ensure that the hoses being used are of short length, large diameter and good quality. The, the main point here is the diameter. That's what's most important. The larger the diameter of the hose, the more efficient the vacuum can perform. Typically, the 3.8 hoses are what are used in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry when pulling a vacuum. And having two of these on either side of the system, both high and low, uh, is more than adequate for achieving efficient vacuum levels. However, in addition to this, manufacturers have now started to see an improvement on results in, in, incre in increasing this hose diameter even further to half inch hoses. And the evidence supports that these diameter hoses will become more increasingly popular in the coming years. So you can see the, the, that the field piece vacuum pump comes equipped with one quarter inch port, two three eight inch ports and one half inch port. It is highly recommended to use the three eight or the half inch port and to only use the quarter inch port for taking vacuum measurements only. Uh, I've seen multiple instances throughout the years of people trying to achieve a good vacuum whilst only using the quarter inch port. And whilst in theory, the vacuum pump will achieve the same ultimate vacuum level uh, using that diameter hose. Um, it's just going to take uh, an, an extraordinary amount more time, um, a, a lot longer than if you were to use a three eight or a half inch hose. Uh, so if you think about it like this, um, you could have the best vacuum cleaner money can buy at home um, with the highest and most efficient motor, but on the end of that vacuum cleaner that you've got at home, you have a connection the size of a drinking straw. All of that extra power and all of that extra efficiency on the motor is just going to be non-existent because you're trying to force it through such a small um, diameter uh, opening. And finally, it is to use an accurate measuring device. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, standalone tour gauges or micron gauges and the digital manifold gauge with integrated vacuum uh, what are highly recommended when it comes to measuring uh, these very small values in vacuum um, here at veal piece we offer we offer both of these products we offer both the sm380 or sm480 wireless manifold with the integrated vacuum sensor uh, the sm480 model here including the 38 vacuum port uh, uh, vacuum port on the manifold it, itself um, and this allows us to use those large diameter hoses, um, such as the 3.8 hose or the half inch hose. Uh, and then we also offer the SVG3 digital vacuum gauge with the same high resolution vacuum sensor. Uh, both of these products have a final resolution of one micron of mercury uh, for ensuring that the end user can see exactly what is happening in the system under these very low uh, vacuum pr pressure, uh, very low pressure vacuum conditions. So that's it for today's presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll just leave you with my contact details on the screen here if anybody has any uh, questions or queries that they'd like to follow up on after today's uh, today's presentation. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thank you so much. You gave a very good um, instruction how to do the best practice. Is also what we do at our training. So thank you for that. And we use your product because, of course, uh, we want to do good uh, training uh, like you explained today so um sylvia i've got uh, some questions for kyle yeah i've got a few i've got a few so i would like to start with this one from jose he's asking if we can use a common vacuum pump in a system with um hc so i think hydrocarbons refrigerants um it's typically it's it's how I, it's it's very similar to how i said with the the A2L um, side of things, in theory, people would argue that the system should be not vac uh, should be uh, ev evacuated, and so there should be no refrigerant left in the system. But like I say, we have to be aware of situations that can happen and instances where, if there's any blockages or, or any valves that may become suddenly freed under the va vacuum conditions, 
um, we have to be prepared. So I would advise against using a vacuum pump on a uh, A3 on, an, on a system that contains A3 uh, refrigerant unless it's stated that it, it, it's rated for that. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I would go with the next question from Rolf. Uh, how can we understand that we need to change the oil from the vacuum pump? Good question. So often uh, you, you'll see like uh, with our vacuum pump, we have a very open and very clear sight glass where you can, can see the oil condition at all times. Uh, often a big sign of um, moisture within the oil is it goes like a milky white substance, like a, a very, it becomes more gelatinous. Um, and that's just that moisture mixing with the, the oil and it creates like a white milky looking substance um, and at that point that is when it's uh, vital that you change the the vacuum pump oil um, so that you don't lose any efficiency of the pump okay that is a good explanation we also have an interesting question from dave he's asking how long should we wait to be sure we have an efficient vacuum if we are not able to achieve the right vacuum we were expecting I would suggest that if you cannot achieve the right vacuum that you're expecting, then you have a potential issue. There may be uh, an issue with the system. Maybe there is a leak. Um, and that's why these 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 uh, uh, vacuum rise tests, um, once you've once you, you know, you've achieved a certain level of vacuum, do a vacuum rise test to make sure that the, the vacuum doesn't rise um, exponentially uh, just to ensure that there's no leaks on the system. Uh, failing that, and if, if the system is tight, then I would also uh, advise that maybe the vacuum pump's size, so the, the CFM size of the vacuum pump, is not suitable for the system size. Okay, so I would maybe leave the next question from Juliet for the debate, because it sounds very interesting for both speakers, if you agree. Uh, yes. Shall we call um, Dr. Jorgensen back? Yes, uh, I think uh, we are uh, ready for the debate. We are at five o'clock, uh, you know, size. so we did a very good job. I thank our 73 attendees uh, that are present, and uh, I would like to have a debate with you because we have important questions now which are common for you. I think uh, the most important one is from Richard. He's asking about uh, efficiency. He's asking, so I would like to ask to both of you. He's asking, in commercial refrigeration, condenser coil, the cleaning can be important for energy saving and emission reduction. I know it's not exactly what we were talking today, but uh, again, it's a best practice, I believe, uh, condenser coil cleaning. Do you have any suggestion how to how important is condenser coil cleaning for energy efficiency and for reduction of emissions? Um, who wants to start? Me? Heinz, please. Yes, in, in fact, we have had questions like that uh, also in the last time. And we have just started making a small, let's say, demonstration video how to clean the condensers in our condensing units because it is, in fact, an issue. Uh, a dirty condenser raises condensing temperature and so the compressor needs more power to do the same job so you it's not refrigerant emissions then but it's let's say co2 emissions because of the power consumption uh, and the worse efficiency is quite important in fact yes kai do you want to add something yep i would just like to echo heinz's heinz's uh, opinion on that Obviously, the, it, in terms of energy consumption, absolutely, it will it will consume more energy. The, the compressor will try and work harder, and you'll also reduce the efficiency of the the refrigeration or air conditioning system as well. It won't be able to achieve uh, the temperature set points that you've, uh, you've, you've you're, you're looking for. So, yeah, definitely, um, definitely a bad a bad thing on both accounts. Yeah, I can add that um, our member from Ireland uh, did a, um, uh, an important test. And it's saying that uh, every degree uh, of you lose because uh, your coil is uh, dirty, so you condense at a higher temperature of one degree, you lose 7% of energy efficiency. This is what uh, our Irish uh, uh, 
uh, member of area is uh, telling us, uh, just to give some uh, example. 7% uh, of energy efficiency of energy consumption higher uh, for every one degrees. So I, gave, I have another question for our debate, which is an important question again. <laughs> um, do you believe it is possible to work safely and quick with all the refrigerants that we have now using the right tools i think this is a common you know this is an important question but of course it's not easy to answer to this question it's taking it's talking about uh, safety using the right tools um, so i want to start kyle yeah, maybe I'll, first I'll, this time. Yeah, i'll start so i i believe that it is um i i just believe that we need to have these educational uh, systems in place that can can educate the end users in in terms of how to use the equipment safely if we are using them safely on 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 high risk refrigerants such as a3 refrigerants or a2l refrigerants we need to ensure that you know uh webinars such as today or or any other educational systems out there are educating these people correctly in in terms of what what equipment to choose uh, and when to use it and how to use it um in order to make sure that we do keep people safe not only the the engineers using it but the the people who are, are working in these buildings where these refrigerants are, and and and, um, and explode, you know, A3 refrigerants or A2L refrigerants are being commonly used as well. Yeah, very good. And uh... yes, I believe we can work safely with these refrigerants, uh, but it is a matter of, as Kyle said, it's a matter of training and uh, getting used to it, some experience, because there are some small extras in the procedure. Uh, so some points where you have to take a little extra care so the most important tool is your awareness in fact yes. and your training and, and i believe um, we should be very pay a lot of attention because we have so many different refrigerants now and you yeah. can uh, distract by not looking properly in the label don't look it properly that this is a fellow refrigerants maybe uh, yeah. feeling uh, safe uh, in what you were doing uh, till last year so Maybe it's not just only competence, it's only not be, you know, not doing as business as usual. Don't do business as usual. Always be aware that you can can be can be different, uh, you know, because people just you know smoke, uh, maybe we they, they they go to the system, they don't think about it, uh, they are distra distracted. Yeah, distracted can be mm -hmm. so it's important uh, to be always very 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 paid lot of attention so our questions for the debate i think are finished i don't know if there are other questions from from the public the last question was from alex the question i asked you was from alex uh, if there are no more questions we finish at 508 which is uh, not bad <laughs> so I thank all the 70 persons that are attendees that are uh, looking to the, uh, to the webinar today. I thank, uh, of course, uh, Heinz, Bitzel. I thank Kyle, Phil Peace. I thank uh, all my sponsors. I put one second my slide back uh, so I can see my slide back uh, in the system, in the, in the, in the screen. I thank, of course, Silvia for her job and Alberto who was in the background all, uh, all the time. And I wait you for the next uh, webinar, of course. Yeah, Feel peace, yeah. bit, sir. I wait you for the next webinar. So do you want to say something, uh, Heinz, before we close? Thank you very much for the chance to be here and to be part of this team. Thank you, Heinz. So Kyle, do you want to say something? Thank you everyone for listening to me today and thank you very much to yourselves for inviting me to the webinar. Silvia? I want also to thank everybody for the attention and the great interaction. It is always a pleasure to have these webinars. Very good. So take care, stay safe, which is important nowadays, and see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.